So he lived that way through the summer, even after I finished having to teach that half course at the end of June. And the campus went into a semi-dormant state for the rest of the summer until the start of the new academic year at the beginning of September. I'd always loved that period, my favorite phase of the academic year, and the whole place is fucking closed except for the library. We began to roam the campus by day as well as by night. Then we began to range beyond the campus borders into the annex, Chinatown, Kensington Market. Then he kind of took over as guide. Actually, even on campus, I'd always had this sense that really, quietly, he knew the place better than me, the ground, both indoors and out. Fire escapes, washrooms, the nooks and alleys of the halls, the alleys between and behind buildings that straights and normies would simply never think to turn into. But off campus, the streets were his world. Of course, I had always gone to places, to restaurants, markets, shops. But when we started going out together, I began to realize how superficially I knew them in their environment on a physical level. The way he only knew the surfaces of my places, because he had only ever seen them from the outside. It was now that he led me to our park, Trinity Bellwoods, which he had fallen in love with when he reached it at the outer limits of his expanding range in the first weeks of his life on the street, at an illegal 15 years of age. He lost his virginity there, got laid for the first time there, as I'm sure he's told you. It was like a walk through paradise for me when I saw it for the first time, the dawn of a night when he, we had woken up in my office at around four and gone out. I had actually never even seen it before, because in my three years at the university, I had never had occasion to ride out that far on either the Queen or the Dundas streetcars. And the city didn't interest me, so I didn't take walks. We approached along Dundas, this grim stretch that we walk every day now, as the sky was getting light. And then, I'll never forget the sudden sense of revelation and expanse when we rounded the corner of the last house, you know, where the path begins that leads down into the ravine. We went down holding hands. By now it was full daylight and there was no one anywhere. When we reached the bottom, I looked up and the sun hit my eye as it was just rising over the verge of the ravine. It was divine, an epiphany. He pulled me into his arms, and we lay down under the tree and made love on exactly the piece of ground where he had made love for the first time. Afterwards, we lay in each other's arms for I don't know how long, spent half dozing, with our pants ludicrously pushed down around our knees, until we heard what sounded like another young couple gasp and titter as they went by. We let them pass, then got up, they had disappeared closed our pants, and continued along the path through the ravine, past the gazebo, up the southern slope, and onto the main ring path, surrounded and canopied by trees. There were a few walkers here, including what must have been the couple that had witnessed us, who stared at us as they passed, with barely contained fascination and hilarity, then burst out in the same tittering. Beyond the park's southern border, a streetcar glided along empty Queen Street, with its metallic whisper. I led him to the old-style monumental drinking fountain, just inside the archway of the park's main entrance, where I slipped my hand into my pants, caught his cum in my palm just as it was slipping out, and washed it away in the abundant vertical stream. We returned to the ring path, rounded it a second time, then turned off onto the path that runs along the western rim of the ravine. I want coffee, I said. We reached Dundas and walked west, expecting to find a coffee shop at the intersection. Just before Ossington, we saw a for rent sign in the window of an apartment above a laundromat. This place. It's ours, I said. 